Right. So, um, and uh, we talk about startups and um, a startup might be a, a little business to take something out into the world. It could be something where you, you, you do it internal to an organization and it might not lead to a real, real business, but it's to take things out into the world. And um, the first version of how to, to create a startup starts with the inventor. So the inventor finds a problem and uh, develops some idea that can solve that problem. He or she would then, in the classical world, would want to protect that intellectual property. Usually involves working with a intellectual property lawyer, and one would would protect the IP. And then what the classic business school model tells us is we then develop a business plan. And um, a business plan, if you Google business plan and you get a template for one, it usually turns out to be a big fat uh, document with a whole lot of uh, sections, including a financial plan of how to get your idea out there into the world. Uh, once you've got your business plan, you go out and seek funding. And uh, that, and in many cases in that world, you would need to have a business plan to get funding. And then you implement that plan. Now, the problem with this linear model of creating a startup is the following. Firstly, um, to, to, to kind of implement the plan, you would typically need some support. It's not, not easy just to go and open a workshop somewhere and do it. So you would need to find a place in some uh, science park or business incubator to uh, help you uh, launch and grow your, your business. Um, the, it's very difficult in many cases to access funding. We'd have to, and we'll hear more about that from Sejo Pozzo later, but we would look at venture capital or innovation funding. And the, this business plan is, um, is a linear process and your startup is based on this business plan. Um, one of the, the um, um, stories that I've been told, and I'm sure there are many others, was at the time of the, um, of the dot-com uh, boom in, the, in California. It was about 2009 and a group of businessmen and innovators uh, decided to do the first online supermarket. They uh, developed a huge business plan, which they went and got people to invest in. And then they went off to, to uh, do the implementation. And their implementation involved doing a lot of work up front. They uh, developed a very sophisticated computer system, which was the plat which was the online supermarket platform. They established regional warehouses, they got trucks, they employed people, and they uh, put a whole team in place. And then there was launch day, and they launched their online supermarket, and everything worked like clockwork, except they didn't hit their targets in the first month. Far fewer people bought their bought stuff from their online supermarket than they expected. After two or three months, they were way behind their targets and they went and fired their marketing manager and uh, they tried new marketing strategies and then they fired the CEO. And uh, one and a half years later, they shut down the business, losing over a billion dollars for their investors. What went wrong? It went wrong because they created a business plan that was based on many assumptions that weren't tested. One of the people involved in that was a professor at Stanford, who was the, uh, the uh, professor of innovation, person by the name of Steve Blank. And Steve Blank looked at, at the problem with that startup and came up with a new approach to uh, developing a startup. He called it Lean Launchpad or Lean Startup. And him and some of his students 
uh, developed a new approach to how to create a startup. They firstly said, well, we start with a great idea. Instead of spending a lot of time and money taking that idea to market, let's first see who might be interested in using the idea. They called it customer discovery. Um, after customer discovery, you uh, would look for who your customers might be, and then you would validate that. You would go out, and they call it, uh, you, you, um, uh, you, you get out of the building, and you go out into your customer community, and you find out whether people really, really wanted what you have invented or created. And invariably, you, will, you might find that, that the customer doesn't want exactly what you wanted. And you then pivot, you then change your idea, you think afresh at who might want it, and then you revalidate. After that, you create what they call a minimum viable product, an MVP. And you incrementally develop a sequence of these MVPs, these minimum viable products. You would uh, take that minimum viable product and get someone to buy it, someone who, who really wanted it. And that would reinforce that there was a market for that. But you, and you then iterate, you then go through more and more sophisticated versions of your product till you get to where you were going. Um, the key thing about this is that every step the inventors involved, in many cases, in the first classical linear model, the inventor throws his or her invention over the wall and someone else tries to take it to market. Here, the inventor is engaging in every step and is helping to modify and pivot uh, this invention. The tool that we use in this linear, um, in this lean startup is called the business model canvas. The, and I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, but the key thing about this lean startup is that it lowers the risk and it lowers the cost. So one isn't putting one and a half billion uh, dollars on the table and then uh, going to market in one big rush, but you take little bits of money and you slowly drip feed it into your idea as it grows and as it gets more sophisticated. I talked about this business model canvas and I wanna spend a few minutes just going through very roughly what it is. And, and there's ample, there's huge amount of material on the web free material, free videos, and uh, free guidance on, on, in terms of how to use it. So uh, don't be too concerned if, if I'm not explaining it clearly enough. You can find a lot more descriptions of how it all works. But what the business model canvas consists of is nine blocks. And if you think of, of a line down the middle of your canvas, so you've got the left side and the right side, on your right side is your customers, is the market. It's who you're going to sell your idea to. On the left side is your business. And that's how you're going to make whatever you're thinking of, of, of uh, providing. Uh, the blocks are numbered. And the first block is the customer segment. Who would want to buy this thing? Who would be interested in this invention you've got? Um, so you, and it could be one or more customer segments. In your middle block, which I've marked uh, number two, is your value proposition. What are you offering that customer segment? So these two things work together. You've got a, a customer segments and you've got value propositions and you're offering something to the customer. Uh, the third block is the channels. It's, it's the, it's the uh, road via which you take the value uh, proposition and you deliver it through communication, distribution, and sales channels to your customer segment. The fourth block is customer relationships, and that how you establish and maintain your relationship with each of your customer segments. 
And then down at the bottom, you think about money, and that's your revenue stream. How would you make money from this um, idea that you have? So that's your market, that's your customer side. In terms of the, um, the left-hand uh, side, it's what your, your company looks like. So your block number um, six is your key activities. What are the main activities that are gonna be undertaken by your enterprise? So what processes would you need in place to be able to, to deliver that value proposition? And then number six is your resources. What resources and what assets would be required to deliver this value proposition? Um, and then you would look at, um, at uh, this one here, which are your key partnerships. So what partnerships would you have to establish? Finally, your cost structure. So if, you, if you've got revenue on this side, you've got your costs on that side. So that's how this uh, business model canvas works. And it's uh, something that you use before you even think of a business plan. It's consciously on one big page. They typically blow these up to a big size and put it on a wall. And then what happens is you, you try to put as briefly as possible your thoughts about each of these nine elements onto the chart. And to uh, just explain a bit further, I'll, I'll give you a little example. So here's my little example. Um, suppose, for example, that you're thinking of targeting um, high wealth parents with young families. And what you're gonna offer them is fashion t-shirts for young children. So here's a family, they've got young children, and you're gonna get a designer t-shirt to that um, uh, parent to, um, uh, to buy for their small kids. Um, the um, channel that you decide, you'll do it all online. These are modern young people, they're on, uh, so on, um, online, they use e-commerce, and you'll use this e-commerce uh, platform, an online platform, to deliver that T-shirt to those parents. Um, your customer relationships will be via social media and via digital marketing. And your uh, revenue stream will, will be calculated from the price of the T-shirt uh, versus the projected quantity you can sell. So you can, can build your sort of revenue model. And consciously, these look like those little yellow uh, stickies that you stick on your chart and you put them up there. But keep in mind, each of these is now an assumption. None of it's proven yet. Um, on the business end of it, you would um, uh, firstly say your key resources, you'll need designers to design the T-shirt, and you'll need some digital marketers who will uh, develop the marketing strategy via social media and to get it out to their target market and your key activities will be to design the shirts. You are thinking that you're not gonna produce them in-house, you'll outsource it, and you'll have to be able to do all the selling and delivering. And finally, you'll form partnerships with shirt manufacturers and some delivery company that'll do the delivery for you, and your costs will be around paying people um, salaries and a marketing budget. So. This looks fantastic. You've got your first version of your, of your business model canvas, but these are all assumptions. Nothing yet is, is tested. Uh, what you would then do is you go out and you start to run little experiments. You say, okay, I'm saying that this is going to be um, sold to um, high LSM parents with young families. Uh, you you uh, don't speak to your th three best friends and say, would they buy your T-shirts for their kids? But you go out and speak to a hundred, several hundred uh, parents with young kids and you say, would you buy a fancy T-shirt for 400 rand a T-shirt? And 
you uh, take the information that they give you and you might find at that point that those people you're speaking to would say, you've got to be crazy. I'm not going to spend a lot of money on a t-shirt for my little kid because kids wreck them and kids grow quickly. So I'm spending a lot of money for a t-shirt the child will wear once or twice. I'm not interested. And you then have to pivot. At that point, you say, okay, who would buy such t-shirts? Aha, maybe grandparents with young grandchildren would be willing to buy it these shirts as presents. So you, you take off this uh, yellow sticky and you replace it with one that says grandparents. By pivoting that, you have to make other changes because your channel will no longer be um, via um, kind of e-commerce and online, but you might have to um, uh, um, communicate via magazines, radio and TV. Um, you uh, might be working through, through um, stores in shopping malls, or you might uh, need in-store reps who will um, sell your t-shirts in the stores. Um, and then it would also change the resources you need. You would now need designers, market, marketers and merchandisers. You would need to um, have a, a um, an, an ad agency to work with. So by changing this one thing that you're now speaking to grandparents and not young parents, your chart, your, um, your business model canvas changes. So this would become version two. And what version two consists of is a lot of tested assumptions. You've now taken these previous assumptions but you've tested them all. And you then think of a minimum viable product. What's the smallest investment you can make in these fashion t-shirts to, to check out if it actually works? So you might uh, look at uh, two or three designs in one or two areas and try to see how that goes. And then you would move to, to the next version. So uh, that's how this business model canvas works. And the key thing about it is that it removes the risk. It uh, takes the risk out of this, this very tricky business of innovation. It's more attractive as well for investors because you're not asking for a billion dollars, but you're asking for a small amount to be able to test out this idea. And it's not until you, you, you move to the next step and the next step and the step after that uh, that you might need to look at uh, doing things in scale. So uh, that's called the, the Lean Startup Methodology. And it's being used all around the world at the moment. It's uh, really how people do innovation and do commercialization. Um, the idea of, of uh, developing complex business plans and um, getting a huge investment is uh, something that uh, doesn't often happen, especially in tech innovation. If you are building a, a, a new gold mine, then you would probably have to use the conventional approach. But if you're building a new gold mine, there are not a lot of assumptions that, that aren't well researched and well and, and based on a lot of experience. So uh, that's what I wanted to say about the Lean Startup methodology. And we can speak more about it uh, during questions. But I would um, like to introduce our next speaker now, uh, who will talk more about that, that funding issue. How do you fund your idea?